Thank you for that time. Just wanted to uh, give you another quick glimpse into Bill before he comes. I brought a little, uh, I went out in my garage and I said, gosh, maybe I could find this thing and I found it. So this is a little thing we had in Service Master for many years. And Bill talked about the objectives that uh, people were important. So we had this little guy here and pursuing excellence was important and we had that and growing profitably was important, we had that. But it kind of just sort of sits there, doesn't it? Unless you take this guy right here, which is the honor God part, and we put that here, and you say, oh, well, magically, when you try to honor God, it all falls into place, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it kind of doesn't. And that's the point, right? It's hard work to keep profit and excellence and people and God in balance. And oftentimes I've thought, oh, well, we could just kind of glue it down. That, that would keep it perfect. But the fact that it takes a long time to do this is reflective of the long time that it takes in reality in the marketplace to keep people and profit and God and excellence in tension. And that's how Bill led us for so many years. I want to just read an afterword from the book, The Soul of the Firm, which was written by his son, Chip. And here's what Chip said. Many of the people of Service Master know my dad as Bill Pollard, the CEO and chairman. Relentless negotiator, and yes, he was. Perpetual gener generator of ideas, yes. Intense questioner. Uh, it's true, he was an intense questioner. I've been on the other side of that table. And guess what? I'm an intense questioner today, and it comes from those times of just reflecting and learning from someone like Bill. But Chip says, uh, well, I also knew him as my dad, the little league coach, the Sunday school teacher, and I'll skip to the end of Chip, his son's uh, afterward. He said, um, I remember the many Sunday mornings in the green pew at Bethany Chapel. I listened to my father sing. It's true, he does sing loud, if not always well. <laughs> but it's because he loses sight of himself and prays to his God. For you see, it's in worship Bill Pollard becomes most alive. The same intensity that leads to things in his life like mistakes and single-mindedness and uh, hasty assumptions and blunt questions are things that make him have a perseverance and a zest for life and a love for God and a love for others. So dad, keep singing loud and trust God to help you sing well. So Bill, thanks for being with us and we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, obviously, I had some reflections on that introduction. Uh, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with you all today and be here this time, the last few days, and to see Dennis and Greg and Scott and all of you that's been involved in putting this together uh, of this important subject. It's obviously been a very important subject for me uh, in my life and uh, so to see you all tackling it and trying to understand it in relationship to those that you'll be teaching and I would say that it the banners behind me represent that this is clearly a two-sided question it does as we talk specifically about vocation in the marketplace and in business it does involve your business school as well as your seminary. And um, uh, part of the challenge, I think, is not simply to focus on the church and what it should be doing, uh, but to focus especially for, for me as I've had a chance to speak and teach in, in business schools all over the country, uh, including those who have the Christian banner over their heading, is that at least in those schools we ought to have students coming out and prepared to understand what it means to integrate the claims of their faith with the demands of their work and to go to a view that extends beyond the bottom line. 
um, or the science of management uh, and to reflect where God is in the management of others. So it's, it's, a, it's a two sided coin here as I look at it and so I'm delighted at the interest of your business school as well as your seminary in this subject and uh, those of other uh, Christian institutions that have effective business schools and are having graduate schools either in theology or a seminary. Now, uh, I hope I generate some questions. Dennis, I don't know, are we gonna have a panel or am I gonna be responding to questions? So, you know, I, I, uh, I'm back teaching. I'm teaching a course at Whedon. Uh, uh, it's a course I taught 30 years ago there and uh, they needed somebody to fill in this. And of all things, it's business law. Part of my background was the practice of law for 10 years. And so I'm, I, I said there was only one condition uh, for me coming back is that when I taught it 30 years ago, I taught it on the Socratic method and I said, I, that's the only way I know how to teach it. So you gotta allow me to do that. It's not a bunch of rules of business law. And uh, um, they, they consented to that. So I, as Greg indicates, I have the ability to ask questions. So if you don't ask me, uh, I may pick on some of you uh, uh, as I do in my class. Uh, but uh, as we begin, uh, etched in stone on the floor of the chapel of Christ Church College at Oxford University are the words of John Locke, spoken 300 years ago. I know there is truth opposite falsehood, and that it may be found if people will search for it is worth the seeking. Over the last three years, uh, as we've mentioned several times already this weekend, we've seen a collapse in our financial markets, a domestic and global meltdown, foreclosures at alarming high rates, unemployment at record levels, and largely an ineffective involvement of government in an attempt to correct the situation. While there's been some signs of improvement, uh, there's still uncertainty about sustainability and certainly about predictability. What are the causes of a financial collapse like this? How many times have you listened to reporters and others discuss that question? Was it the self-interest of profit seekers compounded, compounded by the forces of un, unrestrained greed? Does it reflect the lack of a moral compass and a duty of care and the underwriting of and packaging and selling of those innovative securities involving mortgages? Or do we conclude that these up and down cycles uh, of a market-driven economy are inevitable, part of this creative destruction that's a necessary part of market cycles? President Obama, in reviewing what has occurred, suggested that we have arrived at this point as a result of an era of profound irresponsibility that engulf both private business firms and public institutions, including some of our largest corporations and the seats of power in Washington, D.C. So have we lost our desire to seek and know truth, to act responsibly as we do business, to determine what is right for the common good? Will more legislation and regulation solve the problem? As we conduct business in a pluralistic society, can we agree on a source of moral authority? Can the business firm make money, create wealth, and also become a moral community for the development of human character and social concern? Can leadership make a difference? For those of us who are Christians and serving in the marketplace, does our faith have a relevance to the way we conduct business? Can the work of doing business be considered ministry and calling of God. That's our subject that we've talked a lot about this weekend. And as we try to answer these questions that I posed, I think we should first recognize the reality that it is people who make markets work, people who can be right or wrong, good or evil, honest or dishonest, prudent or selfish, people who are imperfect, weak, sinners, yet made in God's image with dignity and worth. People who have been created 
with a freedom of choice, but who are morally responsible for their decisions and actions. We also should re recognize that in dynamic and changing markets, the ethical and moral dis judgments required of business leaders cannot be determined solely by a set of rules, nor can a socially, commercially desired result always be achieved by the interjection of more government funds or controls. While legislative action may bring a higher standard of accountability and provide more sticks, more penalties for violations, they cannot assure honesty, character, or the integrity of the people involved. So how can these virtues become a more integral part of the way we do business? I suggest that we need a transformation in how business firms are led and how future business leaders are taught. Those of us in the market who are followers of Jesus Christ should provide an example for others to follow. We need to bring our faith to work on Monday and learn to integrate the demands of that faith and the claims of that faith with our work. In so doing, we should be concerned not only about what people do and how they do it in their work, but also about who people are becoming in the process. This important concept relating to the responsibility and accountability of a leader became a reality for me as I was mentored by my predecessors and service master and also through the writings, friendship, and advice of Peter Drucker. Drucker, who is often referred to as the father of modern day management, reminds us that the management of people is a liberal art and as such requires the understanding of the human condition. This includes the recognition that our humanity cannot be defined solely by its physical or rational nature, but also has a spiritual dimension. It is this spiritual side of our humanity, humanity that influences our character and our ability to determine right and wrong, to recognize good or evil, to make moral judgments. It is a driver for developing a philosophy of life, a world view that can provide a moral and ethical standard, ethical standard that is not relative, that is other oriented, and functions even when there are no rules. Management is a liberal art, or as a liberal art, is about treating people as the subject of work, not just the object of work. For the leader, it's about assuming the responsibility of crafting a culture of character and recognizing that the business firm has a duty of care, not only for its customers, but also for the societies in which it operates. To be effective and responsible in so doing, Drucker concludes that leaders must be able to draw upon the knowledge and insights of the humanities and social sciences, including psychology, philosophy, anthropology, economics, history, goes right down the curriculum of a liberal arts institution. But also he goes on to say that leaders must have an appreciation of the role of faith in determining the ultimate purpose and meaning for the life and work of an individual. Now on questions of faith, and the nature of our humanity. Drucker was profoundly influenced by the writings of Kierkegaard. I had many very great and interesting discussions with him on questions of faith. I have the confidence that I'm gonna see him in heaven. In Drucker's essay entitled The Unfashionable Kierkegaard, he comments as follows. Human existence is possible as existence not in despair, as existence not in tragedy, but as possible as existence in faith. Faith is a belief that in God, the impossible is possible. That in him, 
time and eternity are one, that both life and death are meaningful. Faith is a knowledge that man is a creature, not autonomous, not the master, not the end, not the center, and yet responsible and free. Now yesterday we had a brief this presentation by, by Joe Marcello. Joe has just concluded this book, Drucker's Lost Art of Management, where he develops Drucker's thinking in this whole area of management as a liberal art and reflects upon the various influences in Drucker's life, including Kierkegaard. But what Drucker is doing in this whole raising this question that management is really a liberal art is in a secular society, in a secular marketplace, he's artfully raising the question of God in a way that will engage people, not preach to them. And if you want to discuss the question of God and the meaning of question to God, in the secular academy today, in the secular society, in a marketplace, it's essential to figure out how you're going to engage, not pronounce the truth. And so it's, very, it's a very significant work from my perspective. It's one that should be used uh, hopefully by you all in understanding some of the dynamics of relating one's faith to their work in the marketplace. It certainly, I hope, becomes something that is used by our Christian colleges and universities who are teaching business. Now, while this raising the question of God may, for some in the secular academy or secular society, is difficult to accept, let me refer to you to another book where the question is raised. This time it's raised uh, by a scholar, a scholar who was a Nobel Prize winner, an economics professor at the University of Chicago, one who, as I engaged him in conversation, described his faith as, I'm a secular Jew. His name is Robert Fogel. Robert Fogel wrote a book, The Fourth Great Awakening in which he traced the history of religious faith in America and its effect on our society and economy. And in so doing, he concluded that the major issue in our culture today was simply a lack, now this is an economist talking, not a theologian, a lack of the distribution of what he referred to as spiritual assets. There was, he said, a void in our society in the development of character and a provision for people's spiritual needs. He also went on to say that in order for the business firm of the future to resolve the growing complexities of ethical issues, it will have to acquire more spiritual capital. He's raising the question of God. The book was written before the collapse we've just gone through. Who's listened? That's the $64 question. Where has it been coming from our leading MBA schools? We had a, we had a uh, challenge in ServiceMaster uh, where we wanted to affect how people thought, especially the leading MBA schools. In a number of them, we were used as a case study in Harvard and Yale and some of the others. And so we decided to sponsor a lecture series, lectureship series uh, on ethics. Uh, the only condition is we chose the lecture. It was somebody that uh, was not only a committed Christian in the business, but also somebody who could relate to the academy. Uh, it wasn't for the students, it was for the faculty members. And we generally had good reception. We held eight of these lectures and had, had generally good reception in it. 
And I thought we were going to have good reception at Harvard because they were already teaching four case studies on us. And as I talked to the profs who were handling those case studies, they thought it was a great idea, but they said it's got to go to our ethics department first. So I talked to them and they were very courteous, but four months later I hadn't heard back from them. So I called my friends back on the other side of the, the fence uh, and said, what's going on? I haven't heard from anybody. They said, well, Bill, there's a problem. They know you. And they know if you select somebody, that person's going to raise the question of God. And they don't know if it's appropriate for the business school to be raising the question of God. But he said, I've got an idea. He said, if you agree to have it jointly sponsored by the Divinity School and the business school, you can raise the question of God. <laughs> so that's what we did. That's the only one where we had it jointly. jointly uh, um, and Max Dupree, by the way, did a great job in that and, and holding that lecture. But for us in Service Master, we decided to be overt about the issue, and we raised the question of God in our mission statement. Our company objectives simply stated to honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. Those first two, as I've already said uh, this weekend, were, were end objectives for us. The second two were means, but they were all essential for us, even when that beam didn't balance very well, but to keep working at keeping them balanced. We didn't use that first objective as a basis for exclusion. It was, in fact, the reason why we promoted diversity in Service Master, as we recognized that different people with different beliefs were all part of the world that God created. As a business firm, we wanted to excel at generating profits, creating value for our shareholders, and serving our customers. If we didn't want to play by these rules, we didn't belong in the ballgame. But also we tried to encourage an environment where the workplace could be an open community with a question of a person's moral and spiritual development, the existence of God, and how one related the claims of his or her faith with their work were issues of discussion, yes, sometimes debate, and yes, even learning and understanding. We considered the people of our firm as, in fact, the soul of the firm. It did not mean that everything was done right. We sure experienced our share of mistakes. We sometimes failed and did things wrong. But because of a stated standard, we typically could not hide our mistakes. They were flushed out into the open for resolution, sometimes requesting forgiveness. And leaders could not protect themselves at the expense of those that they were leading. The process of seeking understanding and application of these objectives at all levels of the organization was a never-ending task. It involved matters of the heart as well as the head. And it was not susceptible to standard man management techniques of implementation or measurement. While at times it was discouraging, it was also encouraging and energizing as one release, realized the potential for creativity, innovation, and growth as there was a focus on the development of the whole person, not just a pair of hands. Now, regardless of the task, I believe people can find a sense or purpose or meaning in their work. And as I mentioned yesterday, I think, you know, we had a lot of people with mops in their hands doing very menial work, entry-level position, entry-level work. People can develop a strong ethic, even in mopping a floor that extends to the care for others, a sense of community, and a willingness to give back and practice charity. Yes, they can develop a respect for the dignity and worth of their fellow workers, and a willingness to serve as they have the opportunity to lead. As they do so, they honor their creator, even though they may not recognize him as such. The community of work so developed provides a fertile ground for raising the question of God, for a good discussion and understanding of his redeeming love in one's life. Now, when I assumed the leadership of Service Master in the early 1980s, I had the privilege of building on the rich legacy of my predecessors, starting with our founder, Marion Wade, then Ken Hansen, and then my immediate prede predecessor, Ken Wester. Each, in their own way, saw business and their work as a ministry and a calling of God. 
Before the development of our company objectives, our, our founder, Marion Way, used to put it this way. I, I, I can't leave God in the pew on Sunday. I have to bring him with me to work on money. Monday, it's my ministry. Now he also went on to say, I'm not gonna hire just Christians. I'm gonna hire the best person for the job. And that developed into another policy in Service Master. We promote based upon potential and pay based upon performance. <coughs> and we never ask what the person's faith is. Not only is it illegal to ask, but back when Marion found, founded Service Master, there was no law <laughs> saying that. It was part of his principle. In this generally accepted view today, or is it, is it a ministry? Do, do we find that to be a generally acceptable view? How Marion described it, a ministry. When was the last time, and we've, I've already mentioned this, so I'm repeating myself. When was the last time you heard a sermon on business as a ministry, or the marketplace as a calling of God, or hear someone publicly praying for the ministry of people? as they're going to work on Monday? Is this a subject that is just so foreign? I mean, we have the words sometimes, but is it so foreign to the way we do church or to our culture of our faith? To give you an idea of how deeply embedded the issue is, let me read you a letter I recently received from a student just graduating from a Christian college, a student that we had the privilege of helping and supporting. It reflects, I think, some common understandings and misunderstandings of how God works and calls us to a purposeful life. The student starts out by saying, I'm very happy to report that by God's grace and fullness, I actually did graduate. For the first time since age five, I'm not a student. It's been a good four years of learning. I was an English major and a Bible minder, I can now read in the Greek New Testament. I know phrases like inaugurated eschatology <laughs> and hermeneutical fallacy. My interpretation, <laughs> my interpretation of scripture has increased in both caution and confidence. I have made wonderful friends here in breakfast Bible studies, noon prayer sessions, for missions, and afternoons in the fall playing football and in the spring playing baseball, and late nights in the dorm having fun. The farewells will be difficult. So what's next? I'm moving to Kansas City where I'll be closer to my family. I'll find a job and pay off my student loans. What kind of a job? I really don't know. Construction work or some type of administrative work for business. I also will apply to various mission agencies. I feel called to the mission field. And in a year or two, I hope to be in full-time Christian service. Where I don't know, Ethiopia, Papua New Guinea, India. I'll wait for God's call to the right place. Please pray for me in the next couple of months. It's going to be quite a transition. Frankly, I'm not looking forward to it. For the first time, I'm leaving a Christian community to live among ordinary working Americans. I'm expecting a considerable amount of uncertainty and loneliness but I hope to develop some friends at the local church I will be attending. So what is this student saying? Could it be that his view is representative of a common understanding of calling and our evangelical culture? Is there some form of hierarchy in this subject of God's calling with a special place for what we often refer to as full-time Christian service? Will we somehow miss out if we don't do something that fits into this category? Should we think of God's call in the context of a location or a special place of service? Is it only about what we should do and the place where we should do it? Or is it more about who we are and what is our relationship with God? And by the way, where does ordinary work with those ordinary people fit in? <laughs> the ordinary people that God so loves and for whom Jesus died. As a follower of Jesus Christ, 
one of the best ways I've found to respond to God's call to the marketplace and to lead in the development of our firm in seeking to be a moral community was to seek to serve as I led, to reflect the principles that Jesus was teaching his disciples as he washed their feet, including that no leader has a greater or self-interest more important than those being led. And seeking to so serve, the truth of what I said could be clearly measured by what I did or didn't do. My faith and the ethic of my life became a reality as I was able to serve those I led, including asking for forgiveness as I made mistakes. It was the salt and light of what I believed and provided a platform for me to share my faith. Servant leadership has been a continuing learning experience for me. It has not come naturally. The first thing I had to understand was what it meant to walk in the shoes of those I would lead. This lesson that I would learn as I first joined Service Master. And I spent the first two months of my Service Master career as a senior officer out cleaning the floors and doing the maintenance work and the other work, which was part of our service business. In so doing, I was beginning to understand what would be my dependence upon and responsibility to the people I would lead. Later on in my career, as I became CEO of the firm, the faces of our service workers would often flash flash across my mind as I was faced with those inevitable judgments, calls between rights and wrongs of running a business. The integrity of my actions had to pass their scrutiny. When all the numbers and figures were added up and reported as a result of the firm, they had to do more than just follow the rules or satisfy the changing standards of the accounting profession. They also had to accurately reflect the reality of our combined performance, a result that was real, a result that our customers and shareholders could depend upon, a result that our employees could depend upon, a result that would reflect the true value of the firm. Otherwise, I was deceiving myself and those I was committed to serve. Now, unfortunately, but true, There are often many trappings around a position of leaders. Barry, thank you for your transparency this morning. It's often hard for leaders to be transparent, but it gives a sense of genuineness, doesn't it? It gives you a sense of where the heart of a leader is. There are trappings in a position of leadership. There are perks sometimes, prestige of office, As the organization becomes more and more successful, there can be an arrogance of success that can tempt leaders to focus on self and think that they have all the answers rather than focusing on their responsibilities to others. It is the evil of hubris. It is often subtle and can have cumulative effect on judgment. And by the way, it is not limited to leaders in business It can happen to leaders in educational organizations. It can happen to leaders in the church. And it can have a cumulative effect unless it's nipped in the bud. I had to do all kinds of things for myself to try to keep nipping these things in the bud. I'll just give you some, you know, no special parking places in our parking lot, for example. Um, I, I, uh, I, I was so tired at arbitrating at one point about who was going to get what class of car, the cars that the company bought, that I, decided, I told everybody I was going to buy at the very bottom myself. That, that's the car I was going to drive around for the next two years. And, and all of a sudden, all of these disputes about who was, what class people were going to get in different cars stopped. I never, nothing ever came to my office. When we redid our, when we redid our offices at Service Master, one of the things I was always bothered about is those people who wanted the corner office or the window or something like that. And we changed all that. All, all the windows in Service Master were available to the, to, to, the, to the people who did the work. And if you wanted to have a closed office, you had it in the interior of the building and the walls of your office was glass. Uh, so open office, open mind, that was the message. Uh, but 
it, w I found myself constantly working at it. And to, I'm going to tell you a little story which helps you understand that I haven't even arrived yet, but that certainly in this situation I didn't arrive. And it was a, another example of learning from Peter Drucker. Uh, uh, we, we had, Peter was going to be in uh, Japan, and Japan was one of our areas of fast growing of our business. And so I called him up and I said, I understand you're going to be in Japan. Peter, will you, will you teach a seminar, management seminar for our customers? And he said, yes, only on one condition, if you'll teach it with me. So I said, well, I'll take a small part, but uh, if you'll mind if me giving you, you the assignment, Peter, you're going to have the major part. He said, all right, we'll do it. Just give me the details. And so we had it all set up in Tokyo. And, Nice hotel, and we had a room for about 250 people. And uh, I thought this was going to be a, not only a great opportunity for existing customers, but for prospective customers, because Peter is, was, is well known even today in Japan for his work in management. So I arrived the day before the seminar, and our, our folks told me that our partner in Japan had decided not to cooperate. And, and you know, I was crushed. I said, well, what does that mean? I mean, are, are we going to have a full house or not? Well, we've tried to supplement it, and, uh, you know, I think we'll have about 100, 150 people. I said, the room's got 250 people. We're going to have, we're going to have 100 seats empty for Drucker? Well, I, we've done our best, Bill. So the next morning, sure enough, we did not have a full room. Well, as the day went on, uh, I was getting madder and madder and madder at our partner. And so that night, as we uh, ended up with a dinner, Peter and I had a dinner together, I apologized to him and told him what had happened. And he said, don't worry about it, Bill. He said, it's okay. And then I said, well, I've decided that I was going to go down to Osaka, where the headquarters of our partner was, uh, tomorrow and, and review some things with him. But I'm going to get on the plane and go home. I'll show him. You know, in effect, that's, that was the attitude. And... Uh, uh, he said, oh, no, don't do that. And then he gave me a lecture on, uh, on, on Japanese culture. And I was sitting there, you know, I had operated in Japan for 15 years. I knew a little bit about Japanese culture, and I was courteous, nodding my head, but he knew I wasn't listening. So we finished up the dinner, and he went up to his room, and I went up to mine, and we got ready for bed. And at 10.30, I got a call. And he said, Bill, I want you to come up the room. I said, Peter, I've got my pajamas on. He said, that's all right. Take them off, put your pants on, and get up here. <laughs> so I did. Uh, and as I knocked on the door, he opened the door, and there he had a chair right next to the bed. And he said, I want you to sit in the chair. I'll sit on the bed. And so he started out his conversation very directly. He said, Bill, you're suffering from the disease of hubris. You got to eat some humble pie. You got to go down to Osaka tomorrow. If you're thinking what's best for the people of Service Master, rather than your own ego, that's what should be done. Because there's obviously something that needs to be resolved, and you cannot delegate it. It's for your people here in Japan, it's for your people in the States. The best thing for you to do is go down there tomorrow and get it resolved. Obviously, he was directly. He was right, and I was on the train the next morning. But to just show you how God works, I mean, we spent one of those times, which in Japan they call break open your stomach meetings, where I had to listen for about the two hours about all the things we had done wrong that caused them to be mad at us. Uh, but once those were out, we were able to resolve and move on. But how God works, little did I realize it then, or even been able to predict it. But within six months, the president of our partner died. And in two days after his death, I got a call from his wife. She wanted me to come and preach at his funeral. For 5,000 people in the company. And I stood between a Buddhist priest on one side and a Shinto priest on the other side and had the opportunity to share what Jesus Christ meant to me and what my faith meant at a time like this. So, you know, you never know how God is going to use circumstances. But 
that was a, a very important learning experience. But you know, as we invest ourselves in the lives of others, we can see people respond, and God will provide continuing opportunities. Let me share another example to you because it's another letter I received uh, from a young person. As part of expanding our business to China, I had, made several tri I, had, I had made several trips there. After one of those trips, I received a note from one of our Chinese employees who'd been traveling with me as an interpreter. Listen to what Zhu Zhang said in this note. When I grew up in China, religions were forbidden. Mao's book became our Bible. When I was five or six years old, I could recite Mao quotations and even use them to judge and lecture the kids in the neighborhood. Mao said, serve the people. Leaders should be public servants. This coincides with some of the service master's moral principles. But when I think deeply, I see a difference where one works well and the other has collapsed fatally. It must be the starting point for service master to honor God and that every individual has been created in his image with dignity and worth. I believe service masters is designed to be a big, tall tree with strong roots, which penetrates extensively to almost every corner of a person's life. It is still growing in mine, and I'm still learning. Sue is a thinking person. She felt accepted and respected in her work environment. She was confronted with life choices that went beyond doing a job and earning a living. Yes, choices and being confronted with someone who came from a totally different culture. Choices about who she was becoming and how she could relate to God. She was growing and developing an understanding of herself and the purpose and meaning for her life. Now for me, the world of business has become and I'll use another business term, a channel of distribution for fulfilling and living my faith. A channel that has reached the janitor's closet in Saudi Arabia, to the great hall of people in Beijing, China, from sweeping the streets in Osaka to ringing the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. The marketplace has provided a wonderful opportunity to embrace and engage those who do not believe the way I do, but whom God loves, and who by my words and actions should see the reality of that love. Can godly and Christian values make a difference in the way business is led, or a way a leader performs their responsibilities? You bet they can. Creating cultures of character requires leaders to know what they believe and why they believe it, to seek truth, to know their source of moral authority, to know what is right even when there is no code of conduct. Now the global marketplace provides a wonderful opportunity for followers of Jesus Christ to live and share their faith. faith. There is in the marketplace a common language of performance that crosses secular, cultural, and religious barriers. When there is performance in the market, people listen. And yes, some people respond to the redemptive message of God's love. It is, I believe, a high calling of God, a calling that for us in Service Master grew to involve the management and employment of over 200,000 people, delivering services to over 10 million customers in the US and 45 foreign countries. As Joshua came to the closing days of his leadership of the nation of Israel, he challenged the people to fear God and serve him with faithfulness. It was a challenge, not a command, for God does not compel anyone to follow or worship him. It's a matter of choice. In Joshua's conclusion, he emphasized this point when he said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me in my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Now my friends who are experts in Hebrew tell me that that word serve, avadah, has multiple meanings in addition to serve. It also can mean worship or work. Yes, that's right. Our work, whatever it is, can also be a worship to the God we love as we serve and live our faith. Our work can become a center of our worship as we bring alive the reality that Jesus lived and died for a purpose, that those he created may know him as their Lord and Savior. God has called all of us to be in the world, but not part of it. He has called us to be excellent in what we do, whether we call it a job, profession, or ministry. And when we excel in what we do, whatever that may be, as a lawyer, a business person, a minister, an educator, we live our faith in a way that cannot be ignored and contained. We have a platform to proclaim our faith. The choice is ours. So who will we serve this day? How, we, how will we develop and influence a ministry, a community that goes beyond the four walls of our church? Will we be a vehicle for the use of God to help people find the truth that is not only worth seeking, but has eternal value. And as I think about the responsibility for community, let me close with these words from T.S. Eliot's Choruses from Iraq. Remember now, this was written about 1932, something like that. Just think about the climate of the world as as Eliot was coining these words. What life have you if you not have life together? There is no life that is not in community, and no real community not lived in the praise of God. And now you have, now you live dispersed on ribbon roads, and no man knows or cares who is his neighbor, unless the neighbor makes too much disturbance. And the wind shall say, here were decent, godless people. Their only monument, the asphalt road, and a thousand lost golf balls. Can you keep the city of the Lord that the Lord keeps not with you? A thousand policemen directing the traffic and not tell you why you come or where you go? When the stranger says, what is the meaning of this city? Do you huddle close together because you love each other? What will you answer? We all dwell together to make money from each other? Is this a community? And the stranger will depart and return to the desert. Oh, my soul, be prepared for the coming of the stranger. Be prepared for him who knows how to ask questions. Thanks. Now, do we have any questions? Yep. Uh, and also, I love how Talbot reached out, the uh, vocational minister who reached out to the, the business school right. people. Right. Really great. Um, if you would, if you could share some ways that, that you, as a businessman, reach out to people in the vocational ministry. Or less and less, it's kind of hard for to share the personal side of things that sound Okay, now um, you've used a term that I want to make sure I understand. Yeah. Vocational um, ministry. Yeah, folks, folks in full-time um, ministry. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm just trying. <laughs> it, 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 they're, they're being paid through uh, a church organization or a parachurch organization position. Uh, now, are they? I realize that, yeah, I, view, I view my business as a, as a ministry also. We've been through that. Uh, but 
So the ministry might take all different forms, right? Right, exactly. Um, it could be working in the inner city, right. um, which is part of a ministry right. that my wife and I are involved yep. with, for example. Um, it could be a ministry serving um, in places like Africa and other places with microfinance, which Opportunity National, which our family's been, been actively involved in. Uh, so those kinds of ministries, which, which we, we are both involved in personally as a family and also involved in as part of times giving some, trying to give some advice and counsel with them. Yeah, yeah. And of course, one of, one of the opportunities I have is to serve on the board of the Bill Graham Association, which also brings me very close to Samaritan's Purse. So I've been involved in a lot of the ministries of Samaritan's Purse as well. You uh, do it on a, like an advisory level? I mean, I, I, I not only do it on an advisory level, level if I'm asked, and on a stewardship level, but also out working with them in the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very rewarding, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes they may feel I'm applying too many business principles to some of the advice I give, but... The, the whole, I'll just tell you one area that is increasingly a problem for me. I understand the reason for it, but how we support our missionaries. The whole deputation process. And um, uh, I, I think it is flawed myself. I understand it. I understand how it works. I'm involved in supporting missionaries that way, but uh, it not only consumes a lot of time, it's detracting for the person who's out to have a particular assignment, a job, ministry, however you want to describe it. And um, one of the things that I appreciated about one of the principles that Dr. Graham had when uh, his organization was formed is um, he basically said, I'm going to need people to help me get this job done. And uh, if I'm going to ask those people to come and help me, we're going to pay him a salary, and God's going to have to provide. That's part of providing for the ministry. Yes. Could you address the issue of uh, bringing uh, business practices and principles into the church, uh, organizational, administrational, you know, administratively within the church organization? Yes, I, I, I think they, you know, we're, sometimes. Uh, we can't, the church is not a business. I do think there are organizational principles. I do think there are management principles. I do think there are principles relating to how an organization gets a job done that are in common. And they're not necessarily business uh, principles. But uh, defining, just, just the whole defining the role of the pastor, uh, defining uh, what really does the governance structure of the elders look like? Um, and um, uh, who talks about finances in the church? I, 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 have a, I, I go to church today. It's a wonderful church. And uh, we've got a great pastor. But one of the rules in the church is the pastor never talks about finances. The business elder gets up and talks about finances. And I don't think that's a healthy message myself. So, but that's not a business principle. That's, that's a principle that, that reflects really a leadership principle, I think. One of my frustrations, it seems, uh, and, and, and frustration and the, the tension is uh, on the frustration side, uh, most church's administration is pretty unorganized and, and kind of haphazard. And then on the parachurch side or whatever, when, when you start uh, talking about return on investment and, and, you know, how do you balance those two things? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Where, you, where it becomes, uh, on the parachurch side, those types of organizations where everything is really more in business terms as opposed to uh, looking at changed 
hearts and minds. Right, right. Well, one of the things we have in business that is a very helpful tool uh, and sometimes can be misused is the bottom line. But it is, I mean, there, everyone in the organization, typical business, understands the bottom line and the role of the bottom line. And sometimes the role requires some changes in the business, the changes in the structure, changes in what you do, changes in the resource allocation in the organization. Not-for-profits typically don't have a bottom line like that. So compelling, and the church certainly doesn't so compelling have a bottom line like that. That's so visible, that's so measurable. They really, all of them have bottom lines. It's just that it's more difficult to measure it. Uh, because at the end of the year, I think every organization, if not sooner during the year, ought to be saying, what have we accomplished? How have we fulfilled our mission? What are the points of review and measurement? Which, when you look at it, is really a question of returns, isn't it? Yes? Well, we uh, heard a lot from the perspective of uh, management this weekend. I'm just uh, wondering what uh, place you think there may be for workers to find community or even represent themselves in terms of trade unions and how um, that, whether there's a theology for thinking about the common good and how workers, if there ever are conflicts with management, resolve those. Can you talk about kind of conflicts with management? Sure. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, how, how, how do you have in an organization repu representation and input from a broad base of employees? And where that didn't happen uh, in the history of industrialization is a result of why we have unions today to so represent employees. And uh, we, we had the opportunity in Service Master to deal with many, many different unions as we worked in hospitals uh, across the country and also took the same service to large manufacturing plants, uh, including you know, General Motors, Ford, and so forth we worked in. Uh, it, I would have to say that my experience in, in those situations where the the history of unions and management had so deteriorated that it was a completely adversary relationship all the time. So let me just, I mean, it, this, is, this is a shame, but let me give you the experience we had in our, in, in our gen, General Motors plants, uh, managing the housekeeping staff. Uh, the average productivity of the person was less than three hours a day for eight hours pay. Uh, the pay at that point, and this was 15 years ago, the pay was $20 an hour. And um, we were not allowed, our managers, when our managers came in, because we were management, we were not allowed to hold the mop panel to show the person how properly to mop, mop the floor. That was, I mean, we were doing the work if we touched the mop panel. That gave you an idea of the inability of management and the people to work together. And obviously our objective was to increase productivity as part of, part of our management in this situation. After about three months of total failure of getting any kind of progress, and a couple of us visited the plants and tried to listen to what was going on, we decided that our managers were going to have to do something different. They could not relate to the employee doing the work in a normal way. So what did they have to do? You know, they had to join the bowling teams in the community. They had to be involved in the Little League in the community. They had to ha figure out the ways in which they could relate to these people outside of the work environment so the people could gain some trust in them as part of what they were suggesting about new methods to do some basic tasks. And also as part of reflecting, I'm interested in you as a person, not just a holder of a mop handle. So all of those things had to be developed outside of the work environment. And we were able to increase productivity to almost six and a half, seven hours a day. But 
But it shows you the whole transformation process that was necessary because it had become so advers adversarial. Now, that, I'm not anti-union when I give you that example because they played an important role and have had to play a role just because of the way management has approached it. And it gets back to this quote I gave the other day of Henry Ford is, why is I always, always get the whole person when all I wanted was a pair of hands? Well, I mean, if we keep looking at people that way, um, the reaction is there's, there's gonna have to be an, 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 external, an external organization to represent them. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Yes. What thoughts prompted the timing of your retirement and the process by which you went about doing it? Uh, I retired twice. Um, during my first term as CEO, which um, turned out to be a little over 10 years, about halfway through that, we had a lot of qualified people in our company. Um, and I was relatively young. Um, uh, I, I said, I'm not going to talk about an age. I talked to the board first. I'm not gonna talk about an age of my retirement. I'm gonna retire as soon as my successor is identified and qualified and ready to act. And uh, that happened uh, on the first go around in 1993, beginning in 1994. Uh, and I'd assumed the CEO role in 82. Um, so a little over 10 years. Um, and he was a very competent person. He was ready to act. Actually, he was three years older than I was. And, uh, and I stepped back and I continued as chair of the board, but not active in the business. He contracted stomach cancer five years later. And um, we were really not ready for succession at that point. And the board asked me to come back in at that point. Uh, and we were at a very strategic position uh, as to decisions that had to be made in the company. Uh, and usually, typically, major strategic decisions I found you can go this way or this way. Uh, uh, there's not just a right way. And it, it reinforces the reality that when you make major decisions, typically, it's, it's not the direction you decide, it's what you do after you make the decision to make it a good decision. <laughs> And, and on this one, I said, you know, there's gonna be a lot of work in making either one of these directions right, and it's not gonna happen in a year, it's not gonna happen in two years. It's probably a somewhere between a five to eight year process to make this a right decision. And I'm not gonna be around that long. <laughs> I shouldn't be around that long because of age. So, um, and the energy the job took. So um, the board decided to bring someone in from the outside. And there's another whole story to that one, but. But they did. And that's when I retired and pulled back completely from the board and the organization. Why were you so willing to pull back the first time when you were so young? Because um, it was not a job I wanted to hold on to. And I've seen many, many leaders hold on to the job because they defined an age. And it's absolutely the wrong way to look at stepping out of the position. The best way to look for the people is whether there's a successor ready and able to act. But since you were ready and able to act, you didn't need the successor that soon. You were still young. Well, age has nothing to do with it, in my judgment. Age has nothing to do with it. Organizations at times uh, need change of perspective, of leadership. And, um, and uh, so succession is a very, very interesting process. Most, most educational organizations don't really have a succession process. I'm not, I'm not speaking negatively now about anything you all do here, but I'll, I'll talk about Wheaton College, which I served on the board for 31 years. It doesn't have a succession process. You, know, you come to the point of filling the top spot and you go outside and you go through a, some, some search outside. Um, and, uh, uh, I, 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 we tried in Service Master for, for most of our succession principles, we, we referred to it as shingles on a roof. We tried to develop people to take leadership positions. Um, so I didn't want to stand in the way, frankly, of anyone who was ready and able to act. And I think if a person stands in a position based upon age, 
and think they have arrived, they've already sucked in a subtle of hubris because they think they know what's necessary for the future. Whenever you get there, you, you, you're, you're blind to what you should be as a leader. Any other thoughts? Okay, thanks for listening very much. Appreciate you.